We are here at Fully Charged Live, and next to me is something that gives the lie to the notion that the electric vehicle is a new thing. Because at the turn of the 19th century, when traveling in a vehicle that wasn't pulled by a horse was a new, exciting, and perhaps terrifying concept, there was more than one contender to be the champion of that means of motion. And we are joined by Hakon, from the Vancouver Electric Vehicle Association. He's going to give us a tour of some of the features and a bit of the history of this wonderful electric vehicle. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Can you just tell us a little bit about this wonderful Detroit electric vehicle? Absolutely. This car was purchased in uh, 1912 by a couple in uh, Washington, D.C. They brought it to Victoria, B.C. around 1920 and she was the one that was known for driving the car. She drove it all the way up until the early 1950s. After that, it went to a collector, of course, because it was at that point already a collector's item. And then it went through the hands of one or two more collectors, and then it ended up in the BC Transportation Museum. When that museum was closed in 1992, most of the cars were sold at auction, but this car was not. It was actually given to the Electric Vehicle Association in Vancouver, so for us to display uh, and promote electric vehicles. And I heard for a little while that the car was actually being used just by people in the association who would take it and use it for a day now and then? That actually did happen once or twice. We uh, no longer uh, try to drive the car that much just because it's, we need to preserve it for, for posterity. But, uh, but yes, absolutely. Uh, people would just take it for a test drive or a, a joy ride, if you like, and, uh, and, and then uh, enjoy the car. Tell me a little bit about the range of this kind of vehicle, because obviously sure. people assume that if it was a car from the 1900s, it, it must only go 20 feet and need new batteries straight away. So tell us a little bit about that. Absolutely. So when this car was new, it was advertised with a range of about 60 to 80 miles. Unlike today, that was actually a, a conservative estimate, so you could probably get 100 miles out of it uh, in the time. There was also a range uh, test they did, and they drove it uh, for almost 200 miles. So they, these cars had good range. The particular batteries that came with this car were a nickel-iron technology, and they uh, also had good longevity. So the batteries in this car were only removed from the car in about 1993, which was uh, almost 80 years. So. So it really, uh, not only did it go quite a long ways, it also went for quite a long uh, a time in terms of number of years. That's incredible. I mean, that yeah. kind of lifespan for mm -hmm. a battery pack. And was it still doing a useful amount of dri driving range at that point, or was it completely worn out? Absolutely. In 1993, the batteries were only replaced because the cases had rusted through and were actually leaking the electrolyte. So the battery, te the technology that made the electricity inside was as good as the day it left the factory. And that's, uh, we've, because of that, those qualities, we've replaced those batteries now with a reproduction set of also the nickel iron batteries. And therefore we expect them to provide good range and also longevity for as long as all, many of the people who are attending the show today. And I understand we were talking a little bit before, I understand it's quite uncommon for them to have this sort of grill effect at the front? That's right, yes. Um, I don't know what year they started to do the, the, the faux grill on the front, but uh, it was just to mimic the gas cars of the day. Uh, in terms of the number that are remaining in the world today, uh, electric cars, antique electric cars, are actually quite uncommon today at the best of times, but I believe this is uh, one of only a few examples remaining which would have the faux grill on the front. It's very interesting that they chose at that point to mimic the, the gas cars because yes. I understand in the early 1900s, electric vehicles were considered more reliable and more, a little more civilized because they were the car that the ladies could drive. Correct, yes. The, the, the well-to-do lady was actually the target customer for this car. Um, there was a number of reasons for that. Um, it was reliable, as you said. It was easy to start because the electric starter was only invented in 1912. Before that time, the, uh, the, you had to hand crank a car. Um, it was also quite difficult to drive a gasoline car of the day just because of all the different uh, manual controls that were required to make the car actually move. So a lady would prefer that if she was of, 
of good standing in the community, shall we call it. You, you wouldn't want to be the person with oily hands going to have a cup of tea. Oh, that no, would be no, goodness quite... gracious me. The other reason that they enjoyed this car was that the gas cars of the day were mostly open cars. This one was fully enclosed, which would protect your rather expensive clothing and very fancy clothing from the environment around you, the rain or wind. And it would also protect you from the riffraff that were outside the car. You didn't want to be seen. You didn't want to have people know where you were going in those days if you were a well-to-do lady. I suppose it, it sort of really is a horseless carriage, but you have control. You can take yourself where you Absolutely, need to go. Absolutely, yes. The company that made this car was originally a carriage company called the Anderson Carriage Company. The name was changed to the Anderson Electric Car Company when this car was built. And that's why it looks the way it does, because it's truly the epitome of a horseless carriage. It's, it's fundamentally the same technology in the chassis and in yes. the bodywork that went into building yes. a horseless Absolutely, carriage. Absolutely, yes. So that's one of the reasons that the top speed on this car is only 20 miles an hour. And I've had the privilege of driving it and at those approaching those speeds, this car is absolutely terrifying to drive. <laughs> the correct speed for this car is a very leisurely 10 to 12 miles an hour, which is probably, if you were a very well-to-do lady, that's about the speed that you would prefer to go. Well, I remember from reading about the early 1900s, people were very concerned about traveling too fast and how harmful <laughs> that might be. That is true, and people have talked about that. They were wondering, for example, when we were going to break the speed of sound and uh, if you could run faster than a horse and all of these things. And of course, that applied at that time as well. So what kind of work? You said you've replaced the batteries on this vehicle. Correct. Have you had to do anything else to it? So this car has had no restoration as we would know it today. It has had only repairs for the full time that has been uh, on the road and, and, and in, uh, in museums. The uh, paint has been changed because in those days you were expected to repaint a car um, to keep it looking good. However, the paint you see today is probably most uh, 50 years old and therefore it's become an antique again just because it's so old. Um, we've only done repairs on other parts of the car. The motor speed controller has been maintained and, and repaired as required. The motor actually has been, had very little work done to it. The only work that I know has been done is the changing of bearings in about the 80s. Uh, other than that, it just needs oiling and, uh, and it's good to go. Uh, and it's gone like that on the car for the, uh, the many decades that Viva's had it. Just, just repairs to keep it running and even now it's working, as I say, about as well as it did the day it left the factory. That is truly astonishing. Yes. Can you tell me a little bit about the Vancouver Electric Vehicle Association and what you do? Sure. Our goal is to promote electric vehicles. We own this car uh, to help us do that goal. The other goal of the Electric Vehicle Association is to preserve EV heritage both the knowledge and the car itself. So that, that's a little bit about the Vancouver Electric Vehicle Association. It was started in 1993, which is coincidentally the same time that this car was moved from the museum it was in at the time to and given to the uh, Electric Vehicle Association. And, and where could people find out more about the Vancouver Electric Vehicle Association? The easiest way is to go to our website, viva.ca, it's a well-trafficked website and you'll learn more about the car and you'll also learn about the EV events that are going on in Vancouver and um, more about EVs in general and also about the, uh, the questions you will have about uh, charging electric cars and owning electric cars because the members of the Viva are of course electric car owners and therefore you can learn more about what it's like to own an EV and therefore whether or not it suits you. And of course, in most cases, it probably does. Well, thank you so much. And thank you for giving us a little tour of the Detroit. Oh, thank you so much. And thank you at home for watching. Unfortunately, our teleprompter has run out of battery, so I'm on my phone. So on that note, we are done with today's video. If you have comments, drop us a polite note in the Discord chat room on Mastodon, or if you're a Patreon supporter, in the comments there. If you want more, subscribe, hit the bell, and follow the links below to regularly support us with a YouTube subscription or a Patreon subscription. 
You'll also find links to our Kofi, Bitcoin and Swag store, as well as that aforementioned Mastodon server. Scrolling by on my right is the amazing list of charged up supporters, which is great because there's actually an enormous stage over there. So, you know, scrolling by on the stage maybe. And shout outs go to our V2G Patreon supporters, Alan Tapa, Andrew Martin, Bennett Elder, Brophy Wolf, Chris Maxwell, Cyprian Laplace, Dan Blair, Gordon C., Hey Esker, John Trammell, Kyle Fox, Mark Eggleton, Peter Dillinger, Raging Fellows, Sean Tucker, Stefan Fremgen, Stephen Williams, Tesla in the Gong, Paul Bricknell, Tony Moss, Kyle Hodgson, Chris Center, Denny Hyde, Lance Charles, Linda Irish, Mike Weeder, and Paul Nelson. And finally, big thanks to our off-grid supporters, Paul Conway, Kevin Burrowbridge, Stephen O'Donoghue, Jim Burness, Robert Flannery, Aaron Han, Ellery Hensley, Rory Litwin, JP Fagerback, Dave Kitchen, Andrew Glenn, Anonymous Freak, Chris and Michael Johnson, CPU Freak 101, Eric Knack, Joe Bresney, John Henderson, Laura Reynolds, Marcel Ward, Matthew Drobnak, Nigel S, Reggie Watts, Will Graylan, and of course Ian. And thank you to all of you who came and saw us at Fully Charged Live. Don't forget we make videos every Monday, Wednesday, Friday and Saturday on the main channel, plus Sunday on Take Two. And with that, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. I'll see you soon. And as always, keep evolving. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah.